It's Halloween 2019, and I've got over an hour of brand new creepy stories relating to the month of Halloween to rein in my favorite time of year. So, sit back and join us as some very scary friends and I share these tales of terror. Oh, and if you want to wish me a happy Halloween too, like this video, leave a comment, and share the video on at least one social media account. People want to be scared, even if they don't know it. Joining me today are Deadleaf Clover, Zack Baby TV, and introducing Fear the Dark. I'll announce who's reading each story at the start of their narrations. Timestamps will be in the description for you. Also, links to these amazing narrators' channels will be in the description as well, so subscribe to them if you'd love to hear more creepy goodness in their tantalizing vocals. Remember, if you have a story of your own, share it with us at darkstories.org. Now, let's begin. Oh, and happy Halloween. The One Before the Universe from Twilight Born, read by Darkness Prevails. It was late in October, six days before my birthday. My mother asked me what I wanted most as a gift. I paused to think of an answer when my elder brother said to me, why not just get more toys, then we can all play with them. Honestly, at first, that's what I was thinking, but then I remembered my grandmother and what she once told me. So, instead of toys, because we were living in a one-room apartment with two adults and four kids, I replied with, I want a real home where we can have family over. My mother was taken by shock for a moment by my response. She probably assumed I wanted toys, too. After her shock, she said to me, Well, little one... If we do do that soon, you won't be able to have any new toys for a while. Is that okay? Without any further thought, I answered, yes. So that night, while my siblings were asleep, I saw my mother looking in the newspaper. Now that I'm older, I'm sure that she'd been looking for a while. She wasn't simply going to get a new home because a child asked for it. But I think, deep down, I gave her the push she needed, and maybe I helped a little bit, letting her know that she didn't need to spend on my birthday, as long as we could find a new place. I sat down to help her look. We searched for a reasonably priced place, and could accommodate a family of six. I saw a place in Sylvan Beach, New York, that was open for sale, and was quite cheap. My mother said to me, though, don't get your hopes too high. With a price like that, it's going to go fast, and there's probably something wrong with it anyway. I replied, That's okay. We can handle it. She smiled as she tucked me in for the night and said to me, All right then, we'll check it out tomorrow. For now, get some sleep, okay? The following day, we went to the house it was perfect, or at least it seemed perfect to my child mind. The sellers seemed way too eager to be rid of it, but none of us knew why. My mother asked how soon we could move in. The seller said they were ready to go at any time, so she made an offer, and the sellers were entirely willing to work with any of our needs. To my mother's joyous disbelief, we were moving in in no time. My mother called her boyfriend to bring my siblings and our stuff, and we were moving that same day. My mom said that she'd never seen a mortgage move so fast. Soon we were settling in, and my mom was unpacking while calling various family members to brag about her new home. Five of our family members came over to see the house and visit. Everyone was happy for us. But we did have three family members that came over that had always been odd. These three in particular did not practice Christianity like the rest of the family. In fact, they were Wiccan. We loved them and never really viewed them in any other way except family. Until that day. Because when they came over, 
Instead of a congratulations, instead of being happy for us, they told us that we made a mistake and that we should leave and get rid of the house as soon as possible. My mother, being the kind woman she was, didn't take outright anger with this. She wanted to trust them, but we finally had a home and we were committed to it via contract. So we couldn't do anything about what they said and she let them know this. Those three family members outright refused to enter the house. They said they felt that something was inside and that they were afraid of it. After a few months, we all began to notice something quite strange. My mother and her boyfriend were always lovey-dovey when outside, but the moment they came inside, they seemed aggravated, irritable. It was as if pure hatred had taken over, constantly arguing over nothing. One night, my mother and her boyfriend had seven friends over, late night drinking. I woke up in the middle of the night and went to the kitchen to grab a drink. I saw them in there, drinking and making light of everything. I grabbed a glass of milk, and my mother, a bit buzzed, said it was because of my birthday wish that we finally had a new home. However, just as I was about to take a drink, I felt something, I don't know, it felt like something entered me. I was frozen and paralyzed to the spot, before falling to the ground like a tipped over statue, screaming. I wouldn't know until later what I screamed, but apparently my mom said that I was saying, it's trying to take me. At first, it must have looked like a child trying to get attention, but in a split moment, my mother said that all of them saw something they'll never forget. My body was lifted from the ground. My mother ran and grabbed me, had her boyfriend and all their friends grab me as well. She said that they all felt something trying to fight against them, tugging at my body, trying to pull it upwards, as if gravity had reversed. All at once, as quickly as it started, it all stopped, and I felt something leave me. As soon as I was aware again, I immediately jumped up and ran to my brother Joe. I was in a panic. When I found him, I jumped on top of him and covered him like a shield. My mother ran into his doorway and looked at me like I was crazy. I'd never seen her so worried, but at the time, it made sense to me. I felt as if something was going to take my brother away. Eventually, I fell asleep in my brother's bed while my mother watched over us. Not too long after that experience, we were all fast asleep when my elder brother woke up needing to use the restroom, and then he began to scream his lungs out. Apparently, when the kitchen came into view from the hallway, he saw it engulfed in fire. He came and woke me up first, and we ran through the house together, waking up everyone. My mother then got all of us outside. It was the middle of the night, freezing snow. She called 911, but as they arrived, it was a little late. There was nothing they could do. What blows my mind is that we installed all new fire detectors, even had them tested while we moved in. They worked perfectly fine but that night, not a single one of them worked. I can't help but think that there was some sort of force at work here, and it was only by chance, by my brother's freaking bladder, that we made it out alive and in time. I remember a few things of when that thing possessed me that night, but what I do remember is feeling something quite old, very old, something beyond ancient, if you ever find yourself in Sylvan Beach, New York, and you find an empty lot in between two homes, for your own safety, don't venture into that land. Because there's something old and terrifying there. Something that seems driven to kill. Psychotic Step Monster From Brain Dead 22 Read by Dead Leaf Clover. So I had a fairly normal life up until I was 14. 
my dad got very bad into drugs and got into a relationship with a girl, and we'll just call her Beth. This girl was only about six years older than me, which seemed weird to me. My siblings liked her, but I always had a bad feeling about her. Sometimes, I would go to the living room where she would be sitting over my dad, singing. I never really thought anything of it, until she had a knife. I called the police, and they arrested her. As they were taking her out of the house, she said to me, You just wait. I never liked you. I was going to kill your father, and then you'd be next. But that was not the end. Three years passed and she apparently got out of jail. I had just gotten my license and bought a brand new car. I was driving to work, when all of a sudden, this crazy person starts driving right next to me and swerving, trying to push me off the road. I luckily got out of it by taking the next turn I saw. Fast forward a few weeks, and it's Halloween night. I was home alone, and I made sure all the doors were locked, and all the windows too. I heard a car outside, and I live 30 miles away from any towns or highways, so this was unusual. We have our own driveway that is about 5 miles from the actual road, so for someone to be close enough for me to hear the car was what scared me. I looked out, and no one was there. But I did see a far away silhouette of a car. I figured it was just someone using our driveway to turn around, so I went to my room and started reading a book. And then I heard a loud bang and my car alarm started. I looked outside and it was Beth. She was running to her car and trying her hardest not to be seen. I called the police and they couldn't find her. To this day, they never have. The damage to my car was horrible, but the worst part was when I walked outside and a pig head fell from above me. On my windshield, there was a letter saying, Call the pigs on me again. See what happens. This only scares me because nobody knows where she is. The police found her car about eight miles from my house, but she is nowhere to be found. As of now, I am terrified of when and where we will meet next. All I have to say is, watch out because I always look over my shoulders and I now carry. Maniac in Middle School from Anon Read by Zach Baby TV. Let me first set the scene here. I'm a 14-year-old male, but I was 13 at the time. I went to a middle school that was a nightmare by itself, but that isn't the story for today. It started at the beginning of my 8th grade year. I got math for first period. It was just like any other class. Boring. Nothing special. Except this one kid. For privacy reasons, I will call him Andy. And he always seemed off to me. He just set off a creepy vibe when I was around him. So I tried to stay away from him as much as possible when we chose our seats. After a few weeks of school, we got a seating chart. And with my luck, I sat directly in front of Andy. He was much taller than me. I was a measly 5'2", and I estimate him to be about 5'7". I tried my best to ignore the guy, but he never seemed to stop talking. He would always say disturbing racist things, mainly about how much he hated Jewish people. He would make disturbing jokes about hurting Jews. He made me sick. After Halloween, Andy just disappeared. We were all wondering what had happened, but now I wish I didn't know what he had done. On Halloween night, he knocked on a random door, 
A nice woman came out and gave him candy. But right before he received his treats, he pulled out a knife and started stabbing her in the stomach repeatedly. After this crime, he ran off leaving her on the doorstep covered in blood and stab wounds. A few days later, Andy was caught and he now resides in juvenile detention. I am relieved that he has been caught and to hear that the sweet lady has recovered fully, but it still makes me sick what he had done. Andy, let's not meet again. I worked in a Halloween orchard from Alice May 18, read by Fear the Dark. I'm a 26-year-old female, and this happened a decade ago, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. A little information first. When I was 13, I was 5 foot 10 inches tall, and was often mistaken for at least 16 years old. At the time, I'd live with my uncle, his two daughters, and my grandma. We'll call him Jared. Jared started his own business as a pool and spa man, which includes repairs and cleaning, as well as lifting heavy chemicals and other supplies for his business. He is very good at his job, just one of those guys that people generally like and get along with. We live in Southern California in a nice area, and many rich people live here because the weather is usually sunny and rarely gets more than about 80 degrees Fahrenheit all year long, despite changing seasons. So naturally, he has quite a few customers that are pretty wealthy. One of these customers, a middle-aged woman, invited my uncle to attend a huge Halloween party she was hosting at her house and told him that he and his family were welcomed as guests. You see, my uncle was, and still is to this day, a huge fan of Halloween, as well as a fan of scaring people. That was something we've always had in common. So when he heard she was going to have a haunted maze in her avocado orchard, he took her up on her offer, and invited me as well. Though I'm not a party-loving person, I didn't hesitate in saying yes, when he said I'd be working in the haunted orchard with him. The party was fun, they had good catered food, but I mostly stuck to my family members, and tried my best to enjoy the party, but I was more excited about working the maze. About an hour before the maze opened up, my uncle and I went to go and get ready in our costumes. He went to one of the vacant parts of our huge house, while I went to get ready in the guest house. My job was to be more of a distraction for the people to pass by in the maze. I was dressed in a shorter Victorian era dress, with fake stage blood that covered my body and clothes, and had it looking like I was hanging by a noose from one of the orchard trees. The plan was that small groups were going to the maze at a time, and I was to be still and draw people's sights away from Jared, who dressed as Michael Myers with an actual chainsaw, and was right across the path from me. Hidden in the shadows, he would rev up the chainsaw, and people would run screaming, while he chased them down the path. Half of an hour into the job, and everything went without a hitch. But that didn't last. I heard some loud talking down the dark path, so I got back into character, amused by people's drunk and terrified screams. I could hear about five different voices, all of them men. The words were slurred, so I assumed they had been drinking. Most of this had served alcohol at the party, so I didn't think twice on it. A lot of people drank before going into the maze. I had an uneasy feeling growing in my gut but I completely ignored it. After all, I was a naive 13-year-old girl. I thought she would be safe at a private party. I remember thinking that my uncle had been nearby, so I was at all too worried. Well, looky here, one of them said, and some of them laugh and make catcalls. She's a cutie, huh? I remember my breath freezing in my chest, and my uneasiness returned. I was the only person visible, so I knew they were talking about me. I tried to look out to the dark, but couldn't see anyone, due to the spotlight that was shining on me from my feet. It wasn't until they were about 15 feet away did I finally see outlines of the men. Wow, she is, another man said as they walked closer to me. I was past the point of uneasy and just scared, so much so that I completely froze in fear. Though taller than most, I was still only a kid, and all five of these men were about my height or taller. There was no way to fight off or run from them. The men approached me and I remember them completely reeked the booze. Only one or two guys' faces were half illuminated by the spotlight. The other faces were at an angle where they were completely black from the shadow, 
and I remember cursing the spotlight for shining directly in my face. Hey there, baby, one of them said, getting closer to me. It was literally only inches from me as he and another guy reached out their hands to touch me. How about we leave this place and go have some fun instead? Get away from me, I remember saying, finally finding my voice. Oh, baby, don't be like that, he dragged out. By this point, his other friends were surrounding me to where I was blocked off completely. I looked past them to my uncle's area, but didn't see him anywhere. He must have chased the last group further down the path. I was completely alone. A man had reached towards my chest area, touching me, and I slapped away his hands as hard as I could. I said get away from me! My heart beat so loud and fast in my ears, I turned and tried pushing past them so I could run down the path and find Jared, but their bodies made a wall to keep me from leaving. What's the matter? Are we not good enough for you? One of the men said, taking hold of my arm. I pulled against his grasp to try and run, and I mentally prepared for the worst. And I remember taking in a deep breath to scream, hoping that someone would take it as an actual sign that I was in trouble, not just another person who was being chased in the labyrinth. Then suddenly I heard the beginning rev of a chainsaw, and all the men looked off to the darkness, when my uncle's figure as Michael Myers appeared in a reflecting glow from my spotlight. I had never been so grateful to see a serial killer icon in my life. What the hell are you doing with my niece? he demanded, rapidly stepping closer to them. I remember being so relieved to the point of almost crying, but I stopped myself. From the look of these men's faces, this was a six foot tall man who was strongly built, due to his job that he worked six to seven days a week, dressed in an orange prison jumpsuit, a Michael Myers mask, and a very real chainsaw in his hands. Translation, someone who could easily mess them up for messing with his knees. The group of men started to back away from me, and one guy smiled nervously and said, Hey man, it's cool, we were just leaving. The creepy guy turned to me and he said with this eerie and disturbing smile, See you later, baby, he muttered. His hands brushed lightly over my stomach, I froze again, she was running up and down my spine. And the men ran off down the path, and my uncle cussing them out and threatening to call the cops as they scurried off faster. He would have run after them and probably would have done something drastic if I hadn't run over into Jared's arms and began to cry. I was shaking violently as the high of adrenaline wore off. I remember him hugging me, then pulling out his cell phone to call my grandma. She arrived and all three of us went to go find the hostess to tell her what had happened. Sadly, I don't think she was able to do anything, due to me only being able to give her vague descriptions of the guys, since they were mostly in shadow. And if she did, I certainly didn't hear anything about it. Even to this day, I can't help but think what could have happened to me that night, if Jared hadn't shown up when he did. There's been a couple of times where the lady has thrown my Halloween parties, and I still go and work for the haunted maze, but I'm never in direct view anymore, and will actively partake in scaring the people. I have yet to be harassed like that ever again while working there, especially since I found out my true scare tactic, crawling like a fast moving grudge towards people. So I have three pieces of advice to anyone who works in a haunted attraction of sorts. 1. Just because you work there doesn't mean people won't start trouble for you, even if it's a private event. 2. Always be close to another worker, just in case something happens. And 3. Always be aware of your surroundings. Just because you're the one doing the scaring doesn't mean that you won't be the one with the traumatic event by the end of the night. Carnival Creeper from Anonymous Read by Darkness Prevails Middle school is best known as a time of change. You start school as a child and leave as a teenager, and that change particularly happens in middle school. You deal with changes in your own friends and yourself, changes in behavior, in the way you think, I moved to a new middle school after 7th grade. This made the changes a lot harder. This story happened around Halloween during my 8th grade year. I was just starting to get used to our new school. I was beginning to make new friends, passing all my classes. Let me just tell you beforehand, we moved into a rather poor area. 
My dad had lost his job, and we were forced to move into a smaller home. It wasn't super poor, but it was a lot less wealthy than what I was used to. It was a cool October afternoon. Me and my closest friend Daniel were finishing up homework out in the schoolyard. It was about two hours past the end of school. We were just about to get going when we saw a man just past the rusted school gates. This was the 80s. There were no cell phones or high-tech devices. Also, not a lot of school safety either. So the man came up to the rusted gates and smiled at us. We knew all about not trusting strangers, but when he got close, we could see that he was about our height, maybe five foot, five foot two or so. He had gray hair and a shaggy beard. We still didn't take him seriously because of his height. He started by offering us a cigarette. Neither of us smoked, even though about 20% of our grade had started back then. Then he said that he was from the school safety department, and that we'd have to come with him. We outright said no, but he opened the gate and began to walk towards us. The school was pretty much empty except for the janitors. We made a mad dash to get out of there, and we made it to my place pretty fast. But that wasn't the creepiest part. The following day, the youngest teacher had her classroom in a mess. Apparently, someone had broken in, and they had not only stolen pictures of her in a bikini at the beach, but also pictures of students that had been in there. Not to mention, he left a note on the desk, one that was a bit inappropriate, to say the least. Considering what kind of picture he took of the teacher, and the fact that he took pictures from the students, I've got a strong feeling he was definitely the worst kind of pervert. I'm glad we didn't trust him. Halloween Night from Isaac the Troy Read by Dead Leaf Clover So when I was 15, I stayed home from school sick one day. My family is pretty poor, and every adult in the house was at work, and my older brother was at school, leaving me home alone with our two cats. My house was a small house with three bedrooms, all on the upper floor, with a very narrow hallway about three feet long and two feet across. Two bedrooms on the left, and the master plus the main bathroom on the right. I woke up that morning around 12, 12.30 to the front door of my house opening, and I wasn't startled by it. My stepdad and my mom both worked full day shifts every day, so I figured one of them had a day off that day and was home from running errands or something. Upon hearing footsteps coming up the stairs, my bedroom was the one closest to the staircase, I figured it was my stepdad. He walked down the hallway to the master bedroom and into the suite, which I could tell because there was some noise and banging from the bathroom a few seconds after he entered. Now, the hallway bathroom didn't have a working toilet, so everyone who wanted to use the bathroom upstairs had to use theirs. The only other working one was in the basement. The banging continued for about 10-ish minutes and then stopped, and I suddenly heard footsteps thundering from the master down the stairs and out the front door, like he was sprinting. I thought nothing of it. My bedroom door was closed, and one of our cats was in my lap, purring away. So I lay in my room, on my phone, reading, until I heard our screen door creaking open a little while later. I heard his footsteps coming heavily up the stairs again, but without the urgency of before. Now confused, and against my greater judgment, I stepped outside of my bedroom to see what the heck was going on. I looked down the stairs and saw no light coming from the side of the living room where the front door was, leading me to think it was closed, even though I didn't hear him shut it. 
I turned to where the master bedroom was, and the light wasn't on inside. I looked down at the floor below, carpeted, and I didn't see any indentations like there should have been if someone was walking or running heavily with shoes on. As a 15-year-old wimp, I was now terrified and retreated back into my bedroom. The banging from their bathroom having been continuous as I was taking in my surroundings stopped when I closed my door, and the footsteps returned, now stopping right outside my bedroom door. I remember clutching my cat to my chest and holding my breath, heart pounding as I waited for them to leave. And they finally did, after about a minute or so. Heading back down the steps and out the door, now shutting and locking the front door with them. I waited about five to ten minutes before going out of my room again, cautiously going into the end suite to see what all the banging was about but it looked legitimately undisturbed from when I'd used it before bed the night before. Checking the living room and kitchen, I found the same results. I went back to my bedroom and somehow managed to fall asleep again, heart racing from my hours-long panic attack. Before I slept, I turned my phone on silent and put it to charge, seeing as it was about two, about an hour and a half from when my older brother would come home from school. I shivered, hoping sleep would help me feel better, and I drifted off. I awoke later to the front door opening again, arming myself with my acoustic guitar to go and see who was coming into the house. It was my older brother, and he asked me how my day had been and if I was feeling better. My brother is a bit of a jerk, so I didn't tell him about my terror-filled day. Just saying I was fine and staying downstairs to watch YouTube on our PS4 with him. Not wanting to be in my room until my family got home from work or until I finally calmed down. My mom and stepdad came through the front door at 5 p.m. And I immediately asked them if they'd been off work or if they came home during the day to do something or what. And they both said that they had been at work all day and super busy. As my mom used to work delivery for Pizza Hut and a local Chinese restaurant. And my stepdad was an exterminator with a local place. To this day, only my grandmother knows this story. As I didn't tell my friends, or anyone really, about it until now. I kind of repressed it as to not feel super unsafe in my house. But I do know that some people and a cat died in my house in the past. A couple, I believe. It could be a fever dream or something like that. But I'm terrified of being alone in my house. Party Creep from Anonymous Read by Zach Baby TV. It was summer last year. I was 14 at the time. I was changing my clothes for a Halloween party. I was so eager and excited at the time since we rarely have any parties here in the Philippines. So I took my phone and went to my friend's house to fetch her. I said, Kath, let's go. We might get there by the time the party is over. I shouted at her door. She replied, Almost done. So, we're on our way when I saw my crush and my ex walking by the park to the party. I hesitated going to the party, but my friend insisted. We arrived at the party. Everybody was looking at me. Me being 14 and all, and did I also mention that my costume was Harley Quinn from Suicide Squad? Just then... I saw a weird dude heading towards the bushes staring at me. I mumbled, Who the fuck is that? I ignored him when I got a bit dizzy from all the beer and tequila. I headed for the bushes to maybe vomit, which was a bad idea. I was about to let it out when I saw the creepy guy. 
I think he's around 30 or something. I said, Sorry, sir. Then headed back to the crowd. Kath asked me what's wrong when I just nodded nothing. As soon as the party was over, my friend and I headed home. Then my crush, X, and all their friends stopped in front of us and said, Hey, let's go for a ride. We said sure, just to loosen up a bit or something. We headed for the woods close to the cemetery. When I looked around the place, as soon as I glanced to the right side of the truck, I saw that creep at the party. We had only stopped for 30 minutes to smoke some cigarettes. All of a sudden, we all shh at each other looking around. We kept on hearing some footsteps circling us. It didn't seem like it was just one person, more like a group. The footsteps are getting closer and closer. We're all starting to freak out. Then, out of nowhere, my adrenaline rushed and I started shouting, Who the fuck is there? Then we all heard the laughing. Not just any group laughing, but a really creepy loud laugh. Stupidly, we all looked around. After that, there was silence. Then, I felt something grabbed me. It was so dark, I didn't see it coming. My ex, pulling as hard as he could, shouted to his friend, Start the fucking car! Everybody get inside! Then, he managed to pull me from whatever that thing was. It still haunts all of us, especially me to this day. My dad's creepy high school friend, from Choi Longa, read by Fear the Dark. I was eight years old when I experienced the scariest Halloween of my life. Halloween was my favorite holiday as a little girl. I loved getting spooked every time October came around, but I never realized just how spooky Halloween could get. It all started one evening when I was shopping at Safeway with my dad. My mum died when I was a baby, so dad and I were extra close, and we liked to spend time together. Just as we were checking out, I saw a lady by the exit staring our way. She was looking right at me. The lady continued to stare for the entire checkout and didn't stop. Although I was young, I still knew to keep my eye out for strangers, and I thought it was strange that this lady wouldn't stop looking at me. My dad didn't notice, as he was busy paying for groceries. Once he was done, we headed to exit the store and we had to pass the lady as we walked by. The lady stopped us greeting my dad. Hey Koi, how have you been? She asked him. My dad seemed a little surprised at this, and he studied her a little, because he didn't know who she was. Oh come on, you don't remember me? The lady continued. It took my dad a few seconds, but he finally made a recollection. The lady was one of his friends from high school, whom he hadn't seen since graduation. Bella, he said now seeing a little embarrassed for not remembering her. Hi, how have you been? A moment later, Dad introduced me. This is Langa, my daughter. Hello, I greeted her. Bella didn't greet me back. Instead, she looked at me and frowned. I almost thought she was angry at me, but why? I didn't even know her. Coy, it was nice to see you again. Bella gave her attention back to my dad. I looked at Dad to see if he picked up on Bella's negative response, but I couldn't really tell if he had. Bella left with no more said, and I was glad. She wasn't very nice to me, and I was hungry. Dad said we'd get pizza, and I was looking forward to it. It didn't take me long to move on from that. After all, I was just a kid and thought my pizza was more important. Once we went home that night, I pretty much had forgotten about the whole thing. Until a few days later. When I was hanging out with my best friend, Sue Ann, her dad had taken us to get ice cream. I had to use the bathroom and excuse myself from the table. I was washing my hands when suddenly a woman appeared in the reflection of the mirror. She was behind me. I instantly recognized her. It was dad's high school friend again, Bella. Hey there, sorry if I was rude to you a few days ago. I was having a bad day and I was tired, Bella told me. Oh, I said, that's alright. 
Do you like shopping? Bella abruptly changed the subject, with an overly kind smile on her face. She seemed to be in a much better mood now than she was last time I saw her. Um, yes, my aunt takes me shopping, I said, not quite sure why she'd be asking that. It must be hard that you don't have a mother to do those kinds of things with you, Bella suddenly said. I felt shocked. How could she so lightly bring up my mother when she didn't even know me? And even more shocking, how did she know I didn't have a mother? Did dad tell her? I suppose he must have. This was starting to upset me. I never liked people talking about how I don't have a mother. And I really didn't like that this woman I didn't even know was talking about it to me. But I realised I was upset, because the next thing she said was, Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have brought that up. I was just thinking that maybe someday, if you want, I could take you shopping. We could have a girl's day out. I didn't know what to say at this moment. I knew she was my dad's old friend, but why was she talking to me? Why was she interested in taking me shopping? I finally told Bella, I, I have to get back. My friend is waiting. I gave a nervous smile and stepped out of the bathroom. I spent the rest of the day with Sue Ann. We were playing around in the fallen leaves out of my backyard. However, I hurt myself as I jumped in the pile of leaves, because I fell wrong. My wrist was twisted and it really hurt. Dad gave me an ace bandage to wear for a couple of days, till it felt better. A week went by and nothing out of the ordinary happened. It was the day before Halloween. During recess at school, I was outside with Sue Ann. We were playing with our jump ropes. Sue Ann started to feel cold. Langa, I have to go get my jacket, I'll be right back. She ran off and I was alone. My school had a big baseball field and I was at the far end by the fence. I decided I would continue jump roping until Suvan returned. I began to jump, when I casually looked behind me, only to see a figure standing right at the fence line. It was once again Bella, and she was looking right at me. I stumbled on my jump rope, startled at once. I stared back at her, wondering what she was doing behind the fence, back by the woods, at my school. And why did she keep running into me? She continued to stare blatantly at me. Honestly, I was afraid. How's your wrist? Does it feel better? Bella asked. Wait, how did you know about that? I asked, again shocked that she knew this personal thing about me. Bella chuckled. Her chuckle sounded like an ugly, old screeching bat. I knew you hurt your wrist last week while playing in the leaves. Bella continued to grin with that ongoing stare. Oh, that grin gave me the chills, and still does when I think about it. I glanced back towards the school building to see if Suban was coming back. Um, I have to go, I said, uneasily, and started to step back. I was going to take a run for it to the school building. I needed to get away from this freaky lady. But before I could leave, Bella ran into the woods. Langa! I heard a voice from behind me. It was Suan. Suan, did you see that lady? I asked her. Suan looked around. What lady? That lady that just ran into the woods. I didn't see anyone. Sue Ann didn't really care and she got back to jump roping. For the rest of the day, I felt uneasy. I wanted to get home quickly and decided that I should tell my dad about Bella. I was nervous to go out to the bus and I looked about cautiously as if Bella would pop out of every corner. When I got home, dad wasn't there waiting for me. Instead, it was my babysitter, Rebecca. This shook my nerves even more. I really needed my dad. He must be working overtime. Dad was a surgeon and it wasn't uncommon that he'd get held up with patients. I asked Rebecca when he'd be home. He got hung up at work. He said he should be home at about 8 o'clock. Rebecca let me settle in and put Disney Channel on the TV so I could relax. As I was watching Good Luck Charlie, I was starting to laugh and my mood got a little better. I watched a few funny episodes before I'd head back to my room to do my homework. As I did math, I thought about what happened that day. The thought of Bella showing up to my school out of nowhere was so creepy it was hard to focus on my homework. I kept watching the clock, just waiting for Dad to come home so I could tell him. But the longer I waited, the more I thought that maybe I shouldn't. Was I just overreacting? After all, it was Dad's high school friend. Would he be angry to find out I was afraid of her? Possibilities kept creeping into my head, and I decided that maybe I should just let it all go. So me being a dumb kid, when Dad came home, I didn't tell him which was a big mistake. The next day was Halloween. I tried to keep my spirits up for the holiday, but I was feeling very off since the moment I woke up. That scary Bella had me checking every corner I turned, in every room, and I didn't like to be outside. I didn't have much fun trick-or-treating, which was a disappointment because I had looked so forward to it all month. 
When I finally got in bed that night, I had the blankets up to my nose, trying to fall asleep, but my eyes couldn't rest. Every time I shut them, my eyes shut back open in fear of someone looking through my window. I lay in bed awake for about half an hour, when suddenly I heard a knocking sound on my window. My whole body went stiff and cold, as if it were ice, but I tried to tell myself it was just my imagination. However, it was hard to believe that when I heard the same sound again, ten seconds later this time, more rapidly, and it was so loud I couldn't even pretend it wasn't there. I couldn't breathe, I was so scared. I ran to my dad's room, his lights were out. Dad! I frantically jumped in his bed. There's someone outside my bedroom window! Dad had obviously fallen asleep because he seemed aggravated. Langa, he said tiredly. What's wrong? He flipped on his light. I heard someone. They were tapping on my window, I insisted. Langa, you're just tired. No, I'm not. There was someone really out there. Dad knew I wasn't going to ease up. He got out of bed to go check my room like he used to do when I was four years old and scared of aliens. I knew he didn't believe me and was just doing it to ease my conscience but I was scared for him. Someone was poking around at our house. I wanted to call the police right away and didn't want dad to get involved. Dad, I grabbed his cell phone. Let's call the police. Dad was just getting impatient now and he wanted to go back to sleep. I didn't really blame him for not believing me. This wasn't the first time I was scared in bed and went through nights like this dozens of times. I turned on dad's phone only to find that there were three missed calls and two texts from our next door neighbors. Chills ran down my spine when I read the message. We saw someone poking around your house as we came back from trick or treating. We called the police. The text read. Terrified, I hurried to show dad the message and his attitude changed in a second. I knew it must be Bella, but what did she want? Why couldn't she just leave us alone? Dad ran out of the room and told me to stay put. After checking to make sure the windows were locked in his bedroom, I cried for him. If there was a bad person outside, he could get hurt. What if they had a gun? I hugged the blankets around myself and sobbed, but things got even worse when I heard the glass from my living room window shatter into pieces. Disobeying my dad, I ran to find him, terrified that he would be hurt. And once I got to the living room, I'd never been so horrified than this moment. Yes, it was Bella. She had broken into our house, and she was threatening my dad with a 12-inch long knife. She looked absolutely insane, bloodthirsty and inhuman. I screamed at the top of my lungs. My dad yelled at me to just get out of there, just as Bella was lunging at him, almost stabbing his throat. He grabbed her arms before she could, but she struggled, screeching like a maniac. I thought this was a nightmare. It couldn't be real. Dad screamed at me again to go back to his room and lock the door. But I couldn't move my legs. It felt like an eternity, although it was only about 30 seconds when I heard pounding at the front door. I knew it was the police. Even after they busted into our house, Bella still didn't stop trying to plunge that knife into Dad's throat. I stopped screaming as I watched the police grab hold of Bella, who was still, even now, struggling to kill my dad. She was a lunatic. I was still crying with horror even after the police took the knife from Bella and had her walking out to the police car. Although she still struggled to free herself from the cops, she couldn't get away from them. After Bella was arrested, I later learned that she, to no surprise, had mental health issues and a dying obsession for my dad. It turned out that she was in love with him all her life and wanted to kill him since she married my mum. Bella hated him for betraying her and she hated me for my very existence. Halloween has never been the same for me. In fact, I hate it every time it comes. I'm 15 years old now and I still have to check my bedroom window every night before bed. And I still have nightmares about Bella's horrifying grin and her banshee screech. This was by far the most terrifying Halloween. I'd never been so afraid than when I thought that I was going to watch my dad get stabbed to death right in front of me. Maybe I'm going crazy. From Anonymous. Read by Darkness Prevails. This happened close to Halloween in October of 2016. I was in my room, playing on my DS. I suddenly heard a door being unlocked, and then I heard the door open. Now, I thought this was my mom or dad, obviously, but I always hear a key being placed on the table after that, 
but that didn't happen this time. I then began to hear footsteps, awkwardly slow for someone I assumed was coming home from a long day. These did not at all sound like my parents, so I was terrified and stayed still for a while. Eventually, I slowly sat up on my bed, which caused it to make a slight creaking noise. I then heard those slow footsteps getting closer to my door, followed by scratching. Now, we had a cat at the time, but these steps were far too heavy for a cat. I assumed that maybe it was someone's nails or a weapon they had with them, so I stayed still. I wanted to sigh with relief when the footsteps began to walk away from the door, but then they stopped and I could hear someone that I didn't recognize talking to someone else. One thing that I heard was, yeah, but the lights are still on. After a while, I grabbed a broom that was in my room and I darted upstairs. My cat had been up there the entire time. I then went into my sister's room. I explained to her what was going on, as she hadn't heard any of it. She didn't believe me, saying that if I heard anything, it was probably the wind. When my parents came home, whoever had entered the house was gone. I told them about it, but my dad said it was probably the wind too. It was weird that my sister and him had the same explanation, but I wasn't having it. I didn't believe that this was anything less than an intruder or something else. Soon after that day, I heard the exact same slow footsteps again, but they never went to my door this time. The thing is, I hear these footsteps quite often, especially at night. The fact that whoever this is returns, but no one else hears them, no one sees them, I feel like I'm going crazy. Surely if someone was breaking in, we'd catch them or they'd take something. Surely what I'm dealing with isn't some ghost or spirit. Needless to say, we had a very eerie Halloween that year and I still wonder what in the world am I hearing? That's the wrong prankster from Anon. Read by Dead Leaf Clover. Back in 2016, me and my friend, Lachlan, thought about doing the best prank ever. The ghost girl walking through the streets. I went to some Halloween store and they'd sold this white dress that was the perfect fit for Lachlan. The red paint as blood for the white dress and the long wig for covering Lachlan's face. After I bought that stuff, I went home to set it up for Lachlan. After that, Lachlan tried on the whole costume, and I thought it was scary enough to scare my other friends. I started calling my two other friends, Jesse and Gavin, to tell them to meet each other in the car and come pick me up to drive around the beautiful night at 10 p.m. They agreed and hung up. It's 8 p.m. right now, and it's the perfect time to take Lachlan and his costume to the scary bridge that no one drives through. It took 30 minutes to get there. When I dropped Lachlan off on the scary bridge, I tell him, When you see the lights of the car, walk like the ghost girl. See when you're done with this perfect prank. I drove back to the house and waited until 10 p.m. Jesse and Gavin are here waiting for me to hop in the car. Jesse's the driver and I ask him, Can I drive for tonight? Jesse says, Sure, why not? He lets me drive and we start having a good night. And this is where the fun begins. I start driving through the same streets I drove to drop Lachlan off at the scary bridge. But this is where things get odd. I drove 20 minutes and I saw Lachlan walking on the road. Not the bridge, the road. Jesse and Gavin saw it and tell me to drive away now. I said, wait, I need to text Lachlan about this. 
I texted Lachlan. Dude, why are you ten minutes away from the bridge and walking on the road? A few seconds later, and Lachlan texted back. He said, what do you mean? I'm at the bridge waiting for a prank to start. My heart dropped when I read that. I texted back. Wait there, I'm picking you up. This prank is cancelled. Lachlan is ten minutes straight from this other prankster. Jesse and Gavin still telling me to go back. I tell them, we need to go past that prankster. Jesse said, no way. I start driving past whoever is in a ghost girl costume. But when I passed and saw the girl, it wasn't a costume. Her face is like the scary girl's face from Scary Maze. I drove faster to pick Lachlan up quickly. Ten minutes later, I made it to the scary bridge and Lachlan is just sitting on a rock waiting for me. I honked at him and he came in. Lachlan asked me, what's going on back there? I told him what happened. Lachlan looked very concerned and told Jesse and Gavin it was meant to be a prank but some ghost girl interrupted it. I drove back, and ten minutes later, at the same road we saw the ghost girl. She was gone. I just want to get back home. Twenty minutes later, we arrived home safely. We all talked about what just happened back there. After the whole conversation, Jesse and Gavin head home. Me and Lachlan said goodbye. I asked Lachlan to spend the night with me before he headed back to his home. I still don't know who or what that was on the road before getting to the best prank ever, but all I know is it's not there anymore. Zack's Story From Zack Baby TV And read by Zack Baby TV this happened last Halloween in 2018 in my hometown of Bloomington, Minnesota. There is this one really great suburban neighborhood that we love to go to. These places were known too. It's like everybody knew each other and decorated the whole area. It was really amazing. But of course, like most small towns, there is always that one house. The one house that is different from the rest, that does not associate with anyone else in the neighborhood. The one that refuses to do anything with their lawns. The ones that are just plain old, mysterious, and creepy. Well, that's where the story begins. A couple of my friends dared each other to actually go up into that house and stay there until midnight, as it was rumored to be abandoned. But nobody truly knew if anyone lived in that house. Nobody had the guts to actually go up there and knock on their front door to find out. There's rumors of things being seen in the windows, weird noises coming from the basements, and sometimes people say that they have seen things around the property. Of course, these are all rumors, but we wanted to put those rumors to the test. So, that Halloween night... It was about 7.30 in the evening. The sun had just set. Everybody was dressed up in their Halloween costumes, and the whole town was running wild as usual on Halloween night. But this night was special. Tonight, we go on our final adventure before college. Tonight, we're going to do something that we will regret for the rest of our lives. Myself... My friends Junior and Sarah approached the front porch stairway leading to the front door. The wind was so cold it just brought shivers down my spine. We slowly walked up the wooden steps as it creaked until we reached the front door. We all kind of looked at each other. I don't think any of us really had the balls to actually knock on the door. I mean... We've never even seen anyone living in this house. But I know for personal experience, I have seen lights on in the upstairs. And I've heard things. 
but I've never been man enough to actually try to investigate any of these sightings or hearings or rumors, period. Especially not on Halloween night. Out of all nights, this was probably the worst time to try to man up to anything whatsoever when it came to this property. But, here we are. I lifted my hand into a fist position and went the knock on the front door. As I motioned and made two claps on the wood, the door slowly creaked open on its own. Um, did you guys just see that? That was probably the wind, Junior said. Sarah didn't say a thing. Um, I barely even knocked on the door, dude, I replied. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Let's just get this over with, okay? This is all Sarah's idea. What? Sarah said in defense. And we all slowly and cautiously stepped inside. I felt like my heart was going to explode out of my chest. It was pumping so hard. I mean, I'm already overweight, so my blood pressure was already a tad high for my age, but... Jeez, though, I was really freaking out on the inside. I just didn't want to show it in front of my friends. Okay, guys, so... Now what? I asked. Yeah, like, I'm actually surprised any of you even stepped inside, to be honest. Sarah said sarcastically. Well, this is your idea, Junior said. And I don't back out from nothing. I ain't scared of this place. Shoot, it's just old, that's all. Yeah, I don't know if I believe this whole haunting thing either, but this place is truly creepy, I added in Junior's defense. Well, Junior told me that he's not afraid of anything and that he is the baddest dude that there is. So, yeah, let's go ahead and put that to the test. And since you want to join him, I guess we'll just all tag along together, she said, smiling. There's something really weird about her tonight, I said to myself. She's got bigger balls than me. I wouldn't even have came in here if it wasn't for them. Anyways, we started walking forward past the pantry down to the door to the basement. Okay, we're not going down there, right? We're just going to walk around the kitchen and check out the living room, right? I asked them. Oh, somebody's scared. Junior said, smiling. No, I'm just saying, it might be dangerous down there. Who knows, it might be full of mold or something, I said. But I knew they weren't buying it, and they then knew that I was scared. And that just made things even worse for me. Well, since you're so chicken, <coughs> Zach. What? I said. I'll go first. Well, if you're going to volunteer, go right ahead, be my guest. I said. We each pulled out our flashlights, and Sarah slowly turned the knob, opening the basement entry door. There was a strong, chilling breeze that blew out from down below. I don't know how this is possible, because it's underground, but it smelled incredibly disgusting. It smelt like death, and decay, and God knows what else. I can't even truly describe it. As me and Junior stood back, Sarah slowly walked down the wooden steps into the basement. And within seconds, the basement door slammed shut right in front of our faces. The windchill stopped and the smell disappeared. We suddenly heard the cries of Sarah screaming trying to run back up the stairs, but something was happening behind that door. Something we couldn't explain. All I heard was banging and clinging and her screaming for help. Uh, we rushed to the door and tried to open it, but it was locked from the inside. We banged and banged on the door. We even tried to find something that I banged on the door with, but there was nothing in the house. It was completely empty. We tried our shoulders, which failed. We tried kicking the door down. That didn't work either. When we tried to put our weight to the door to try to see if we could break through, we heard banging coming from the other side of the door. We both jumped back and I almost fell on my ass. 
Holy shit. Sarah is not alone down there. I reached for my cell phone, but I didn't have any service. I'm going to go outside and make a call then, Junior yelled, and he started running backwards, leaving me behind in the kitchen. Junior, wait, don't leave. That's about as much as I could muster when I saw that dark, misty silhouette from the stairway grabbed him and rush him up the stairs like he was as light as a feather. Now, mind you, Junior is a good 300 pounds. He's a big dude. It happened so fast. All I heard was his screaming as he was being yanked up to the second floor. I started running to go up towards him to see if I could help him out. His screaming stopped. And that made me stop. I was incredibly scared at this point. Do I investigate and try to help my best friend? Or do I run outside and try to get service and call the police? I chose to continue up those stairs and try to help my friend. I walked up halfway through the staircase, and as I glimpsed upstairs, I saw my friend. He was pinned upside down in the open room, arms stretched out like an upside down crucifix and his intestines were dangling down, hanging down on the floor from his stomach. Blood was splattered all over the facility. I threw up and shit myself as soon as I saw my friend. I instantly tried to pick myself together and race down the stairs towards the front door as quickly as possible. As I was going down the stairs, I heard thumping noises like something was chasing behind me. I dared not to look back. I knew for if I was to turn back, I may possibly be next. I ran as fast as I could through the common area to the front door, opened the door, and ran as fast as I could down the stairs on to the main street. I turned around, half crying and trying to breathe. While I was gasping for air, I saw those eyes. Those red eyes of something silhouetted in the darkness of the open doorway. And then... The door slammed shut. <laughs> Happy Halloween! A Scary Drive Home from Zombie Fan, and read by Fear the Dark. This is a true story that happened to me over 20 years ago, somewhere in Maine, but the details are still very clear in my mind. Halloween is my absolute favorite holiday, and I love decorated houses, businesses, etc. While driving somewhere, I'll usually pull over and park to look at every detail of a well-decorated location. This one particular time I was driving on a back road around 11.30pm, on a cold night near the 31st. As I went by this house I noticed a graveyard scene that looked interesting, with a low ground fog that added a spookiness and reality to the scene. I pulled over and sat with my car idling, as it was cold out, to look at this wonderfully decorated front yard. It was an elaborate graveyard scene, complete with body parts strewn about, bodies hanging from trees, lots of gravestones, bats, rats, skeletons, and some graves were partially dug open, with zombie hands and heads, looking as if they were digging themselves out of their own graves. It was very quiet and very eerie, excellently and painstakingly done, with lots of details to include inscriptions on the gravestone. While I was sitting there quietly, enjoying every moment and joyfully noting every detail, suddenly a man with a mask leapt out from behind a gravestone, started a chainsaw and ran, and I mean fast, right towards my car. He was dressed like Jason Voorhees in Friday the 13th Part 2, the dirty pillowcase with eye holes for a mask, and overalls with a flannel shirt. I sat there for a moment, stunned and shocked, as I never expected this, and then took off like a shot down the road. He chased my vehicle for a while, and when it was clear, he wasn't going to catch up. He just stood there in the middle of the road, smoke coming from the running chainsaw, watching me drive off. 
As I think back to this event, I have several questions. I recall that the house itself was totally dark, with no lights on anywhere, except one outside lantern to shed light on the scene. There were no vehicles in the driveway and it seemed as if no one was home. So I'm thinking, this dude is just sitting there in the dark and the cold, late at night, just hoping a vehicle would happen to drive by on this rural back road. Wasn't he cold? There weren't any other vehicles on the road. How did he know I was coming? Did he know that I would pull over to sit for a few minutes looking the scene over? Did everyone who went by do that? How long was he out there before I came by? Wasn't he uncomfortable kneeling and crouching behind that gravestone for a while? The idea that someone would go to all that trouble, just hoping that someone would drive by and stop long enough for him to come out running with chainsaw in hand. That idea in itself is freaky. Was it really just a prank? Or was it some demented soul who was looking for a chance to do something more than just a scare under the guise of a Halloween scene? I'm glad I'll never find out. I'll just accept that he was looking for a harmless scare. But who really knows? Sleepy Hollow Scares From Joseph-122 Read by Dead Leaf Clover Whenever people think of Sleepy Hollow, they tend to think of Ichabod Crane, the Headless Horseman, and what happened the night Ichabod disappeared. My story doesn't involve any of these people, but it does involve the town of Sleepy Hollow and how it changed my perspective of the supernatural. But before I tell the tale, I think it's important to know a few things. First, I have gone to Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow a couple times before this, usually as a class field trip. And while I definitely was creeped out by the stories, I never believed wholeheartedly that there was something supernatural. Second, my perspective on the supernatural has always been foggy to say the least. Because my father is a devoted Catholic and my stepmother is a Protestant. But my stepmother and my sister have always had the ability to see spirits and were always more connected to the supernatural than I was. But because of my parents' different viewpoints, I was never quite sure which one to believe more. Of course I believe in the supernatural but I never thought it would affect my life. Now that that's out of the way, I'll tell my story. This happened either my senior year of high school or after I had graduated. I remember it happening in the fall, more specifically, just before Halloween started. My girlfriend at the time, Victoria, always had a great love for anything that came from the American Revolution. And although the legend of Sleepy Hollow takes place after the revolution, it is still tied to colonial America. And like my sister and stepmom, Victoria had a connection to the supernatural that I didn't. And so we always took trips over to Sleepy Hollow. And the one place we usually visited was Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. So one day, Victoria and I are visiting the cemetery like we always do. But on this day, we decided to do something a little different. We headed a little further into the cemetery. I thought nothing of it. After all, a lot of people were buried here. One of the tombstones we came across was that of Washington Irving, the man who wrote about the legend of Sleepy Hollow. And as we headed further into the cemetery, we came across a mausoleum. And it belonged to a woman named Leona Helmsley. We couldn't go into the mausoleum because the doors were closed and locked, but that didn't stop us from trying to look through the glass doors. After trying to peer through the glass for a few minutes, Victoria's mother was waiting for us at the car just a few feet away from where we were standing. We headed for the car, but as soon as I got into the car, I had a really bad, burning feeling on my left shoulder. I didn't know what was wrong with me, 
so I rolled up my shirt so that I could see what was going on. I used the window from the car as a mirror, and I will never forget what I saw. On my left shoulder were claw marks the size of tiger claws, and they were fresh. Victoria and her mother were completely shocked when they saw them. I knew in an instant that these were not made by human hands, because if they were, I would have felt them from the instant I got them. And they weren't made by any tree branches passing by, because there were no trees above or near us when we were at the mausoleum. After seeing the scratches, her mother took us out of the cemetery immediately. And I think after this experience, it was the last time I ever went to that cemetery. And if it wasn't, I never went near that mausoleum again. I can't even recall the last time I've been to that cemetery after this. I think the only reason that I didn't get more permanent damage done to me was because I was wearing my chain and the medallions that I have had on my neck ever since I was a baby. My chains include a cross and a St. Joseph's medallion that were given to me by my grandfather. So in a way, I had avoided something far worse than just a few scratches. I don't know what it was that attacked me, or why I was the only one affected by it, but I do know this. After this experience, I wholeheartedly believe in the supernatural. If someone were to ask me, do you think there's a such thing as spirits? I say to them, I don't think, I know they exist. And I may never see the Headless Horseman, but there are definitely evil spirits in Sleepy Hollow, so if you ever plan to go there, you best be prepared. Thanks so much for tuning in to this year's Darkness Prevails Halloween special. Be sure to check out and maybe even subscribe to my amazing helpers using the links below. A huge thanks goes out to them, Deadleaf Clover, Zack Baby TV, and Fear the Dark. Now, I know it's the time for scares and dares, thrills and chills, but I just want to wish you all a very safe and super fun Halloween. Be careful out there, and keep a close eye on each other. I know Halloween should be nothing but fun, but there are always those human monsters at the very least who might try to ruin it for you in the worst way. So be good to each other, and be careful, everyone. Have a great Halloween. Good night.